So welcome everybody to the first of a week of webinars from the Open Ed SIG, um, supported by ALT uh, and ALT infrastructure. So we're very grateful that we can offer these opportunities for people to come and get together and talk about open education and matters, matters of education and outreach that uh, are really important. So we're going to look today, the focus will be on uh, the future, what next for JISC and UK OER in a post durham world. But before I get that started, I just want to make sure that um, all the technicalities are sorted and everybody can um, hear us. You can't really access a webinar if you can't hear or see what's going on very well, so let's just go through this. So if you haven't done this already, can you please check your um, audio setup? Uh, so this is the little menu at the top left hand side, tools, audio, and then the setup wizard. That will make sure that not only can you hear us, but should you wish to, you can um, also speak to the rest of us as we go through. Um, your audio settings uh, can also be accessed here if you need to turn anything up or change anything. Um, and certainly a headset with a mic is probably the best way of making sure that you can hear us. And for participation, we have a chat panel. Um, please do um, participate and join in. Uh, I know this sort of uh, session perhaps doesn't lend itself very well to uh, open chat, but do chat using the text chat. And we will pick up any questions and things and return to them. It will help us to do that if you just prefix a question with a Q. And um, you can, of course, message people individually through the um, interface, through the um, participant interface there, as explained. Um, if you have any uh, technical issues, just send a link there to um, just send a, a message there to the moderators, and we'll do our best to resolve those. Um, we're still getting people joining, so we'll just give everybody a chance to run their audio setup wizard. Um, Hopefully you've seen, and I will post right now, the link to our main web page. So this is our static web page that sits on the alt um, pages. And hopefully you've seen that we've got a run of webinars this week. So today we have one. We have another one on um, uh, Wednesday and another one on Thursday. Um, yep. And lots of... Uh, excitement building towards the OER 16, so um, hopefully you'll be able to, to join us for all of those. Everything will be recorded, so the recordings will be available. Um, and we're also in the process, Terry has been working very hard on this, we're also in the process of um, adding some additional ways of building the um, community and uh, Martin Hawksey from ALT has helped us set up a buddy press site. Um, so more news of that later and keep an eye out on that open ed SIG. Um, uh, keep an eye out there for the um, announcements that are, that are just starting to come out and uh, that will be as a work in progress at the moment, but it will form a really exciting um, and interesting new way for us to connect. So the webinars, yes, Monday, Wednesday, and I think Thursday rather than Friday, but I'm just going to check that first because you may be wrong and I could well be wrong. Let's have a little look and double check that because I know there's one that I can't make. So the 7th, the 9th, and the 11th, which is indeed Friday. Great. Okay, Siobhan, let's move to your first slide and hand over to you. I know everybody's very keen to hear all about what's going to happen next or where we are and what the future holds. Okay, thank you, Teresa. Yes, I think I've set myself quite a, an ambitious title there, um, so I will do my best to answer it as best I can. But anyone who's read the, the sort of brief about today's webinar will know that I'm also going to address where Joram is currently up to. Um, just move the slide along. Okay, so there are a number of questions that I think today I will aim to answer. Um, so where are we currently up to in terms of the, rep the process of retiring Joram? Um, so I'm going to talk about that. Um, 
We also want to explain what a retirement enjoyment will look like and obviously what it won't look like. Um, so I think it's important for people to realise what will actually happen when the service is gone. Um, importantly, and this is what we were ask, asked to answer a lot about when the announcement was first made about what will happen to the resources. So we'll spend some time talking about that. And then I'll finalise the webinar with talking a little bit about the Just Content and App Store. Okay. Okay, so if I begin with the timeline of, of where we are so far. So it's hard to believe um, that it's nine months ago uh, since the announcement was made to retire the Joram service and the team have been working feverishly away to some extent um, to carry out a number of activities uh, to see that retirement process uh, come about. Um, that's largely been focusing on the uh, content and, and what we do with the resources. Um, but we've also worked on coming up with a list of alternative platforms. Um, you know, we've, we've always been aware that Joram wasn't the only platform, but we wanted to include that on Joram with the, the news of the retirement. So that was made available in October, and it may well be that that list is, is continued uh, post Joram. Um, and then through the autumn, we really started to look at the content in detail um, and how we could uh, make decisions about the content. Um, you know, was it all worthwhile moving out of Joram and into some new solution, or was it an opportunity to maybe weed out some content that um, was no longer of use um, for various reasons, and in some cases, some very good reasons. I think uh, I think weeding of collections is, is something I'm very aware of with my uh, former library background. Um, so that, that's how we approach that that side of Christmas. So we were able to make a number of significant decisions uh, that did rule out a lot of content from Joram. And having made that decision, we then added that information to each and every resource in Joram in January this year. So every resource now has an indicator on it. So it's a, a, it's a red for not to be migrated, it's a green for to be migrated, and uh, an amber for a decision still to be made. So, yeah, as I said, so through the autumn, we had a problem, basically. Um, so there are over 16,000 resources in Joram. So even if the team had the expertise to assess every single one of those resources, you know, we, we simply would not have had the time to actually make a decision uh, on each resource. And when I say, how do we get 16,000 down to zero, that's not us trying to get rid of any content. That's purely us trying to make a decision about where that content should uh, exist uh, in the future post Joram. So we were able to make some early decisions. I'll show those now. Um, and some of them were, were certainly very valid from my point of view and from you know the team's experience of, of working with open educational resources for a number of years. So the first one I determined was web links and we have nearly five and a half thousand web links in Joram believe it or not and the reason for dismissing these from here on in is the fact that when they fail they give a very poor user experience you know the resources are not actually held in the repository which I think is what a repository should be for it should actually hold the content um, you know so that that's sort of a lesson learned from Joram let's not allow that to happen anymore. So we were able to rule that out pretty quickly. So you'll see that any resource currently in Joram that's a web link will have a red no migration uh, indicator. Then we, we also thought about um, restrictive licenses. Um, you know, and, and anyone who's uh, in the webinar today who attended OER 15 last year and heard Cable Green's talk about the sort of, the sort of the spectrum of open that the Creative Commons licenses actually talk about, you know, and there is a spectrum there. One end of it is, I think, in many people's opinions, including ours and Joram, truly open, open and therefore suitable for open educational resources. And the other end, and I'm talking about those licenses that have, you know, no non-derivatives in it, are not. And if they're attributed to an open educational resource, then it's not in the true spirit of uh, OER. 
you know, David Wiley has talked about the four or even the five hours of o openness. So again, this was an opportunity going forward of no longer allowing that kind of content to, to um, you know, be called open education resources. Because if you can't remix uh, it in any way, then it's not really OER. There were another, uh, there were other licenses within Joram that, you know, there were slight anomalies with them, and again, that's that's over 500 resources. But as you can see from this diagram, that still left uh, over eight and a half thousand resources that we still needed to make a decision on. But nevertheless, that that is what the current indicators are based on at the moment. So most of them are, are amber at the minute. And I also mentioned uh, in that timeline that we had a, oh, sorry, I'm getting ahead of myself. This is the this is a, a current resource in Jorms. It's actually one of my previous webinars. And there's, because it's Jorm specific, there's certainly no need to migrate it into a, uh, a new solution. So this is what one of the indicators actually looks like. Yes, yeah, so, sorry, I mentioned that in the timeline that we had a decision tree. So this is currently on our website at that address. We have a section on the JORAM website where we put all the information about the retirement, um, as you can see there. So this, this is part of the content assessment work. Uh, and this just describes the decisions or how we've come to the decisions about the resources such, so far. And as we make more and more decisions, we'll, we'll add to this. So anyone who looks at a resource and wonders why we've made that decision, then this, this decision tree will hopefully help you uh, realize why that is the case. OK, so next is where I think the remaining timeline for Joram is, is going to come. Um, so our next steps, and we've been working on this since January, is to dis determine the rest of the, the content and, and make a decision on it. Um, so we will have that completed by the end of April. So every resource in Joram will, will be identified as either migrating or not migrating. Um, and at some point, it's a tentative date, say, of June, um, but at some point, um, once the GIST content in App Store is, is up and running and available for deposits, then maybe there will be a month's grace where we'll, we'll allow Joram deposits to continue. And at some point, we'll, we'll end that ahead of 30th of September. So I, th I think it seems to make sense to tie it in maybe around June because of the sort of academic year. OK. So as I said, we've been working since January, or rather my colleague, Pete Collins, who's on the, the call today as well, so he's, he's there to answer uh, any more detailed questions about some of our decisions that we've made so far. We, we've made some positive decisions about content that we want to migrate. Um, so our undecided has got significantly less, which is good for us. Um, so some of the content we uh, identified uh, so far includes the Information and Digital Literacy Skills Collection. Uh, and the reason for that is that, that with ex um, the collection was created in November 2013, and it, and it, it started with a, approximately 50 resources. And since that date, it is, uh, it, there are nearly 200 um, resources in there. And so like over 150 resources have been created in just that short space of time. So they're very current and they're very good quality. So assuming it met all the other criteria, it wasn't a web link, didn't have a restrictive license, you know, we, we gave it the green light to be migrated. So that's how we've um, identified uh, our next approach. And it, it's quite an iterative process. Um, we haven't started the content assessment process knowing exactly how we were going to get to zero. It's It's only through examining what we've got, um, and we've never examined the Joram content in this much detail ever before, because we, we've simply not had the time. Um, so it's only when we really get under the bonnet, if you like, of what's in Joram that we're able to make some decisions about what to migrate and what not to migrate. So we're going to continue that process throughout uh, the rest of March and April um, to get the remaining just over 4,000 resources down to zero. So we're probably going to take a collection by collection approach. We're also going to look at maybe file types, other things like that. Um, and as I'll explain in, in the later stages of the presentation, there, there are other things that we might look at as well that the content store might require. 
So there's uh, just an indication of of what those resources will look like currently. So that's the amber indicator, as you can see. So to be decided. OK, so what will a retirement jor retired Joram look like? Um, those of you who are familiar with JISC will probably be aware that there have been a number of changes in the last three to four years. Um, there have been another a number of organizations, such as the regional sports centers, JISC Tactus, JISC Legal, um, that have been um, subsumed into JISC. And MIMAS is, is also one of those um, areas. And that, that's where the JORAM team comes from. So MIMAS used to have its own website. But when that was sort of closed um, following the, the move into JISC, um, the web address um, was moved to this, this page um, that you can see here. So if you put in limus.ac.uk, this is the page you now come to. Um, so basically, when Joram is closed, and you type in the www.joram.ac.uk address, you'll come to a very similar page. It will, it will not have, it will not look like the Joram website at all. It'll be a disk page that tells you what has happened as a result of this decision. Um, so we may um, keep some of the content because um, there are a number of really good uh, support uh, guides available on Joram. Obviously, we won't keep anything that's Joram specific, um, but we have some really good guides about uh, attributing Creative Commons licenses, citing Creative Commons licenses, and just using them, as well as OER content creation tools. So we'll try and keep that kind of content as, as guides within the JISC website, so we may well point to them from here. And you'll be able to see an archive of, of the original website, or the, sorry, the website as it was when it was closed. What we will also have on this page is an archive of the Joram content. Um, but what that is, is it will not allow any kind of browsing or searching. Um, you won't be able to pick content uh, from it. Um, the intention of that is if anyone wants to get all of the content from Joram, say, and, and add it to a repository, then they can do that. Um, but it, it's not going to be an accessible uh, entity for individuals trying to get their own resources in some way, or, or anybody else trying to get resources. OK. So just going back to answer a bit further about what will happen to the resources in Joram then. So as I've said already, by the end of April, a resource will either have a, a green indicator, as you can see here, to be migrated, or it will have a red, will not be migrated. Um, all the ambers will have gone. So what that will mean is for the green resources, um, that means they will be migrated to the GIST content in App Store. So they'll be available at some point um, ahead of the 30th of September already on, that, on the store. Um, but they'll also be available for download until Joram closes, and they'll be available on that archive that I just mentioned. The difference with the red indicated resources is it will not be migrated to the GIST content in App Store, but the other, the other two uh, availabilities apply. Okay. And what I would say is, if by the end of April, um, so we do, we do intend to, to have some sort of other public uh, announcement about, about the status as, as they are then, um, and we'll be contacting depositors directly uh, where we have their details, is you know if, if any depositors have any issues with, say, the resources, even if they don't want it migrated, in fact, um, but if they've got any issue with their resource not being migrated, then you know, please do get in touch with us. And that goes for users of content as well. You know, even if you're not the the author, we will try and work with the OER community to, to ensure that resources that are liked, used, useful, you know, that we will maintain them. Okay, so finally now, uh, just going to briefly talk about the the new just content and app store. So this is this has been developed by another department within JISC, so completely outside of and separate to uh, the Joram team. Um, it originated, um, I think, about a year and a half ago, uh, out of JISC's Summer of Student Innovation program. And what that is is a sort of a Dragon's Den type scenario where where students sort of pitch ideas and then and then work with JISC to get them developed. So our our future our 
colleagues in Just Futures uh, wanted to provide some sort of platform to enable that development and facilitate it and promote it. Um, and this is where the App Store idea sort of originated. So the, the, the idea of providing content evolved after that and from that um, to become um, this new idea of having a shop window for all of Just products. And when we say products, we mean apps. We might mean services, uh, content services, and, and things like that. Um, you know, so as well as the Joran content that will be in the the, app, the content and app store, there will also be content around digital capabilities, which only you might be aware of, digital leadership. Okay, so some store features then. Um, so some very standard expectations in this day and age. Um, and standard as they are, there were still things that Joram in its present state could never actually um, fulfill, or at least not at all easily. Um, but you know, re reviews rate, rating the recommendations will certainly be there, as you would imagine from any uh, App Store experience. Anyone who's used the Apple Store or Google's Play Store, you know, will, will know what to expect from that kind of uh, experience. Um, and equally, anyone who's used those those sites will know, you know, that they're very image heavy, um, but very very metadata light. So that'll also be important. So again, when I said about there there be certain other conditions that we'll have to try and meet with the store, is the ability to present images of of the content. So maybe some thumbnails of a screenshot and things like that as a resource to get give people an idea of. Um, whether or not they want to, to download it to use it. You know, and again that's been something that we we've been asked for for a long time in, in Joran, you know, to make it more visually appealing. Um it'll also have this ability to create playlists. And again, a Joram nice to have feature that we always wanted um was a sense of having uh an almost not quite a mini MOOC, but you know, a mini course where you could you could link your own content together in a sort of program of study if you wanted, whether as a learner or as a tutor in some way. Um, so I think the playlist will be a nice feature. Um, and two of the other things that are going to be quite different um, with the store are, are the latter two here. This open source software approach and a governance model to content. Um, like I say, the Joram team are not directly involved with the development of the, the content store, but we did have a very useful meeting with uh, our futures colleagues back in November. And during that meeting we, we had a we had a workshop where we were able to feed in what we felt as the Joram team were the requirements of the OER community. And I think I'm not speaking out of turn for the rest of the team, but we sort of came out of that session with a sense of, you know, we're kind of designing the best version of Joram um, that we could have could have come up with. Um, so this idea of the open source software approach um, and uh, Pete and myself will be speaking at OER 16 next month in a bit more detail, well as much detail as a 15 minute slot will allow us. Allow us. Um, but we'll be specifically talking about the open so source software approach. Um, and for anyone who doesn't know what that means, um, I'm not an expert myself, but it, it will enable users to sort of take a resource um, and fork fork off and create their own uh, version of it, you know, and they could resubmit that and it become part of a, a bigger or better version of the resource. So, you know, the, the new store will facilitate versioning, which again is something that um, uh, Joram could never do. but our community wanted. And finally, the governance models content. So what we want to do is put a lot more ownership on on the authors to sort of own their content and manage their content. What we want to avoid with the store is that you don't have this dump and run mentality um, where content is just dumped in the repository and totally forgotten about and never sees the light of day again or never gets updated or um, you know there's, there's just no indication Apart from say a, a a created date or you know an accession date as to how valid that resource still is, so that's going to be improved with with the store. Um, so that 
that's pretty much um, as much as I know about this store. Happy to ask questions or direct them to my futures colleague as needed. Um, but yeah, that's that's the end of the webinar. Um, so if you've got any questions for me now, I'm, I'm happy to take those. Theresa, I'm not sure what's coming Thanks. through on the chat box. Yeah, it's probably. It's gone through that as like a world win. <laughs> no, you've done, you've done an excellent job there. It's all very clear, Siobhan. Thank you very much. Um, and there has been a, um, some chat going on in the in the text chat, so I'll come back and, and uh, go through and return to some of that. If anybody would like to speak um, to Siobhan as well, just uh, use the raise hand button and uh, We'll come back to that. Since some of the questions that were raised, I think actually you sort of subsequently went on to answer. But I'm just going to come back and oh, there we go. We've got someone wanting to speak. So okay, Hi. let's just uh, ask you to press your um, talk button to see which order those came up in. And sorry, just expand this, make it a little bit easier to see everybody. Okay, so we have some mics open now, so let's have a look, little look. Josie, would you like to press your talk button? Hi, can you hear me? Yeah, that's great, thank you. Yes, I can hear you. Hi. Um, so my question is around this um, community-owned platform model, which is a great way to go, I think, and in terms of the kind of ethos and vision for the open content and for open practice, it makes perfect sense. It's a really, you know, it's, a, it, it, it's absolutely the right way to go. But what are the interim arrangements for making that happen? So you won't have a community turning up magically overnight what are the kind of staffing and management arrangements for that transition and for managing that transition? Uh, that's a very good question, Josie. Um, and I don't have an exact answer, but um, I've been very much aware of trying to um, maintain the existing community from Joram and try and bring that into the new solution as best I can. So I've been working with uh, a colleague at JISC specifically, who's, who's almost my equivalent to this project, so not, not the technical person. Um, she's a lady called Sheree Footring. I'll just put her um, name in the chat box because um, you'll be able to find her email online if anyone wants to get in touch with her. Um, so I've been trying to bring her into these kind of, the sort of softer discussions, if you like, about um, communicating um, with the community. So like I said, we're maintaining our OER presence to try and, our OER 16 presence to try and keep the community informed. Um, that that's actually gives me a good idea because we're having one more Joram steering group um, next week. Um, so actually that, that would seem to me a very good agenda item. Um, to get their advice on, because um, unfortunately it is it is still quite early days in terms of that service coming online. I think it's going to be released as a beta possibly even this week. Um, and that's the other change again with uh, how our colleagues in Just Futures work and and how Joram never quite worked uh, in terms of. It's no longer going to be the case that we sit on products, services until they're perfect and then release them because then we just slip and slip and slip with the de development. So I think what they want to do is get that beta out there and get feedback. So I think we'll probably be using the existing Joram channels to get that. So there is an element of trying to maintain the continuity there in terms of getting users involved. And again, like I mentioned, I certainly want some sort of overlap in terms of depositing so people Hopefully people will be able to see how not easy it is to deposit in Joram and how much better and nicer and easier it is to deposit in, in the new solution. Um, so it's not something that we have an answer to just yet, Josie, but I'm very much aware that, that we need to support that transition. Um, and it, it's a process that JISC is also working through itself at the minute as well at a, at a higher level of how we transition these uh, 
big pieces of work that futures are creating and actually bring them into service. So uh, we're kind of working on that um, process as well at the minute. So I think the, the GIST content in App Store will actually be a bit of a test for that process. So we're going to learn a lot through doing that. Thanks, Siobhan. That's really helpful. I don't think any of us pre really could have imagined just how quickly, um, the, the, how quick the pace of change would be in terms of the technological development. And I'm sure that has been a major challenge in terms of, you know, sort of managing um, open resources. There's been quite a lot of um, yeah. discussion in the chat around, um, you know, one sole place of deposit or multiple places of deposit. My, pers my personal take is actually, you know, spread things around, <laughs> put them in multiple places because that's always going to make them more available. Um, there, there's a question here from Viv, my co-chair on the open air. Yes. Like, Do we have an OER champion in JISC? Siobhan, I'm <laughs> looking to you, really. Again, I, I think that leads on from... <laughs> no pressure. <laughs> um, well, I can, well, I can say it's not me, I'm afraid, um, because I am going to be moving roles within JISC, so it won't be me. But I think there, there, is, um, there is going to be a new sort of focus from within um, my area, my department within JISC, the digital resources. So there's going to be a refocusing um, in there, and I think at that point we need to really think who's going to own the service. And I think that, again, like I said, that's part of the transition into um, from futures into sort of a service mode for these things. And at that point, I think that's when the, the sort of product service manager will become that focal point. Um, so I think. It, it will, there will be a role, and it'll probably be that service manager as it has been me in the past. Um, but yeah, because I, I know with OER, my title, I, I'm certainly looked to as the sort of OER contact within JISC, which is obviously what it should be. But I think until we actually know who's going to take it on within our department, I, I can't answer that question initially. Um, but it, it's good that these questions are coming up because this is obviously where concerns are, are coming. So we'll be very much aware of this as we transition and all that's, the way through to September. That's really so helpful. Your question, and, Liz. Uh, you know, I think yes, we're all a bit nervous about not knowing quite where things are going. But um, but it's good to know that actually this is on the radar and this is something that's a live um, discussion. And uh, I'm just sort of scanning back to see if anybody has any further questions. But do um, click your talk button if you do want to ask um, Siobhan a question and if she's able or her colleagues to help us with that um, and be able to address it. We only have a little while left now so Oh, okay, so Liz, thank you. Liz is telling us in the text chat that there are a number of people in just subject specialist teams who embrace OER and all things open, um, and that's great, isn't it? That's a, that's a, a good thing to know because yeah, it's, it's not all about a role; it's very much about an attitude towards education. Um, yes. Yeah, because the service would only form one part of a bigger mandate around open education. Um, so yeah, I fully agree with Liz's comment. Liz, do grab the mic if you want to. <laughs> and Celeste. Yes. <laughs> I've worked with Celeste up in Scotland on open badges and, and things like that. And I know that's something we're keen to continue looking at is something like open badges. Uh, for any new service. Um, so yeah, the, the open education agenda is still strong in JISC. I sound like a <laughs> Star Wars well, geek now. As that. you mentioned open badges, we have got an open badges conference in Southampton um, tomorrow. Uh, great. Okay. Yes, so my colleagues attending yes, this week. Look yes. forward to seeing 
lots of people down there, about 150 people coming along to talk about open badges in higher ed. There's a lot of very interesting links and useful links being exchanged in the chat. Um, and just if people want to hang on to that, if you come to um, file and save, you can save the chat and then you can access your links if you know, rather than having to sort of um, scour through them right now. Um, so there are lots of good, good content here to return to. Yes, Josie, sorry. I've just seen uh, Tavis's question about um, resource share. So that, that's the service that we offer for uh, College Development Network in Scotland that's based on the Joram infrastructure. And the answer is we haven't actually um, discussed the future uh, in any uh, firm detail as yet, Tavis. Um, but we will certainly be communicating, communicating that um, as soon as as soon as we do, or in, I'm sure the College Development Network will communicate that through you as to as to what changes might occur. Great, Michael, Travis, Siv, anybody, if you want to uh, turn your mic on, we'd be happy to hear you. If you would rather do that than text. Yeah, I've just seen Michael's text as well. We only have oh, one door and window, um, and that's the University of Leeds. And again, we'll we'll be in uh, discussions with them. Although, what I would say, if if anyone had been considering um, a door and window at some point, there will going a bit technical now. It's technical as I can speak. There will be an API for the new content store, so people, as with Joram before, they could build their own interface using that API and and pull out what content they want for themselves. Right. Yes, there's some. Um, Chelsea, I don't know if you'd want to like to come back on the um, issue you raised, and which is really about you know we don't want to go backwards from what we've achieved. We've always worked so hard, and and few harder than Josie actually in Leicestershire to to make the gains on open. Um, but it's kind of reassuring to hear from Siobhan and colleagues that actually OER is very much an open an open practice is very much on people's uh, minds and uh, very much supported. Well, you're very kind to say so. Um, I appreciate that very much. Um, what, what I mean, my my concern at the moment is that, um, as as we said in the chat, that. The situation, particularly for England at the moment, in regards to open education and open education practice, is pretty grim in terms of political vision and leadership. Um, and while I agree with your comment previously about the fact that yes, we should be sharing resources in as many places as possible, and we should be kind of distributing things and make you know that that is a sensible way to go, and that is taking full advantage of the actual benefits of the internet as well. Uh, my concern is is that by decentralising access to OERs, we're also making the kind of fragile state of open education at the moment in in England in particular much more vulnerable to being ignored um, it's a, it's, I think it's a huge concern for most people working in this area and I think the fact that Joram's going you know and I really really appreciate all of the work that the team have been putting into uh, providing a fantastic um, resource from the site but it's it's not. It's very hard to take as an entirely positive thing. Um, you know, lots of people previously used Durham as their first resource port of call for people, and used it as an example of a brilliant OER repository, and used it as an example of a really successful service that's UK based. And if we haven't got that as an example, um, it's you know, it's it's very sad. It's it's a sad thing to lose. I'm really interested in the kind of longer term um, and securing the longer term gains that we've made as a as as a, all of us as a community. And I really, really do think at the moment that we need to step up in terms of 
political lobbying at the higher levels because there's very little going on, there's very little appreciation or understanding for the value of open education and there's no push for it at all at those levels. Um, so I'm really, really keen that just understand that clearly because just do clearly understand the benefits of open educational practice and open educational resources and I would like to see them really pushing and lobbying hard um, to try and take that forward. Yeah, I think we we absolutely share your concern. I, th I think we're we're at a stage really as a community that we need to say for each one of us and everybody that we work with, open educational practice is each of us. So we need to lead by example. We need to model as many of you are actively doing. We need to model this behaviour. We need to spread it and we need to make this a grassroots movement and normalise it. So on, on sort of behalf of the Open Ed SIG, and I know Viv's here as well. She hasn't got a mic at the moment, but I know she shares my passion for, for Open as well. We, we really want to um, normalise the exchange of um, discussion and debate around what open means and, and that's everything from you know what, what's open versus free and all, all the sort of very important discussions that we have to have in order to go from the overall idealistic concept of open to the pragmatics of how do we do it and how do we do it effectively and, and what we're trying to do now uh, this week in fact is to uh, start building and strengthening that community by um, creating an area within the Open Ed SIG that will be a community-based uh, buddy press site that will enable people to um, blog and to comment and to discuss and um, just to, to grow the community and grow our visibility. Because you're absolutely right, we need to lobby at the top, but un unless in, the, in this age of austerity and everything else, unless the, the top can see that actually we're prepared to put the legwork in. Um, I, you know, people are not going to waive um, funding and things like that around. There just isn't the resource. Um, Terry, thank you, has just shared uh, the first Open Ed SIG blog post uh, link there in the text chat. Um, so, yeah, we're starting this discussion off and uh, we've got more things coming, everything's still in the process of going live, um, so do take a look, do get active, do share um, your insights and, and Josie and um, many, of, many of those of you in this room have many things that you can share and bring. I, I don't know how others feel but often I find it quite disheartening when I talk to practitioners and, and they have no idea what open education is about and if there's any time when we should be um, getting that message over this week is the, probably the, the best time we can seize, um, have discussions, um, get people to com commit on our open ed um, uh, web page, we actually have a, a sign up there to, to commit to open. So. It's you know actually pledging your activity um, to the cause of open education. Um, Josie, go ahead. Sorry. Hi. Sorry. Thanks again. So uh, this, I've just opened up the page and it looks fantastic and it's a great start. Can you comment a little bit more about how you see the vision for? this particular site as a hub because obviously in the UK we've got several organisations that are involved with open education and supportive of open education um, including you know the OER yeah, Research Hub, um, Open Scotland and the other organisations. We've also got um, you know uh, Wikimedia, a, a yes. lot of organisations. Is this being positioned as the kind of hub for the organisations that are going on across the UK because I think that is something that's really, really well, needed. I, I think we, we have to listen to the community on that. So our idea is, is to make it as open and inclusive as possible. You don't have to be uh, an ALT member in order to access it. Um, so it, it certainly will be open in the, in the true sense of open. Um, 
whether it becomes a hobby, you know, I mean, as many of us do, that actually putting things out there doesn't guarantee engagement. So it's very much down to how people receive it and, um, and what they want to do. We certainly want to advocate and um, we certainly want to share um, people's evolving understanding of open and what it means. Um, to us. So, you know, a, a blog post, if I may be so bold <laughs> to ask you, Josie, at this point, a blog post would be very welcome um, so, so that we could actually sort of join these dots together. Um, does that help? Can I just uh, make a point uh, in response to some of Josie's comments? Please do. Um, I mean, I fully agree with you and I, I'm going back to sort of the, the transition and things like that. I very much don't want um, the new solution to be like I think perhaps Joram may have been guilty of or, or any repository of, you know, if you build a technical platform, they will come, you know. So it, you do need to attack this from both um, grassroots level and, as Liz says, senior management, you know. It's not something that any of us can do alone. So, yeah, we do need to have to... We do need to centralise our efforts in some way. Yeah, I think I, you know, I'd I'd love it if um, if the SIG could step up and take that position because I, I understand what you're saying about well, it's up to the community and how the community perceives things, and there's obviously um, you know lots of different organisations involved in this space with lots of different priorities as well, but there really does need to be a centralised um, organisation and it, it's not entirely how the community um, perceive it or want it to be, it's also how you're positioning yourself too. And I know that you might want to not uh, step on toes by positioning yourself in that way, but surely between all of the organisations in the UK that are working in this in this um, sector, there can be some kind of agreement made um, to have a nominated centralised place so that people can actually talk to each other across organisations and coordinate actions and practices. Yeah, I think there's a, there's a kind of a natural fit in a way between uh, the um, Alt Open Ed SIG and the OER conferences, of course, because every year um, th those conferences reinforce the message and disseminate uh, and extend. So there is a natural fit, but it is very much down to individuals. And, you know, it, it, I think there's kind of, it's quite difficult to get through that perception. If somebody puts something in front of you, um, the perception that it, it's something that that someone else made that's external. We, we have to start somewhere, so we've started with a, a buddy press site and, and we have some great facilities within that. We've, we've only started really to make a few things available. So we're going to be very much listening to people and if you're on that, on the GIST mail list or if you join the, the um, um, SIGS uh, buddy space area as well, join in those discussions. It, it's yours, it's not ours. It's, it's a, this is a community um, area. So the more we as individuals put in, the more all of us collectively get out. Um, so yeah, we want, to, we want very much people to embrace this and shape it. I will, I will take your form comments forward uh, with JISC as well, Josie, about taking more of a, a leadership in this area. That's great. Thanks. I'm just taking a quick scan through the uh, chat to see if there's anything I've missed. But please, folks, if you've got something to say and you don't feel you've been heard, just click a mic. And uh, we very much welcome your voices. And Tavis, yes, thank you. Talking about sort of getting um, getting nice visual examples of things that are you know things that can be shared quickly, and uh, things that uh, people understand, things that get to the heart of teaching and learning really, and discussions around teaching and learning. And I don't think you can really separate out certainly open educational practice and skills of teachers and teaching and learning. So the you know for people to embrace. 
um, teaching and learning, and we're starting to see that. I was at the JISC um, uh, Digifest uh, just the other day, and it's a much greater emphasis at last on practitioners. Um, we need to connect um, practitioners and get ownership, and something that Josie did, I think, very effectively in, in um, Leicester with getting policies that actually make it clear um, that, it, that you have the rights over the things that you create and you therefore can share those things and do something more with it. And I think that's a very important message that we have to give back to people. Does anybody have another question or something they would like to bring back? I know some people have had to leave already. I just don't want to uh, wind up until we're absolutely sure that everybody's had their say or asked their question. Yes, I agree, Liz. Sometimes people really do, you know, sort of what's OER all about? And I think that there is a danger around OER sitting in the R, sitting in the repository where things repose. And actually what we want to see is things being actively used. So my, my mindset is more around OEP, I have to admit. And so all that, how does this work in practice? And absolutely, we're looking forward to seeing people at OER 16. Uh, and yes, Viv, Viv will be there facilitating debate, no doubt, around um, OER. So I'm just going to um, wind up the webinar with uh, just a reminder for people that the Open Ed SIG um, is an open, uh, supported by the infrastructure of, um, of ALT, is an open public group, um, a special interest group, uh, mindful of the mission of open educational practice. Um, you can uh, tweet us and connect with us on the Open Ed um, or the OER Discuss just mails and, of course, on our um, website which is connecting up with the blog and uh, greater work as well going on there going forward and there will be an uh, an open ed sig uh, session as part of oer 16 so thanks all very much for coming along today i hope you're taking an active part in the rest of open education week share the share the word get the word out there, grab the um, Open Education Week badge, put it on your websites, get it as visible as you can. And uh, thank you all very much for your contribution and thank you very much, Siobhan, for really leading us through all the work that's been involved with the uh, um, Joram and um, JISC transition. You're welcome. Bye-bye, everyone. Thank you all very much for coming. Have a great week and keep that open ed sig hashtag going so we can continue to connect. <laughs>